Baron 73 Charlie, you are 20 miles southeast of San Francisco International. Radar vector for the ILS runway 28 right approach. Baron 73 Charlie, turn right heading 230 degrees, descent to 4000 feet. Baron 73 Charlie, you are 2 miles from Dumba, turn right heading 260 degrees, cleared for ILS 28 right approach, maintain 4000 until established. You are watching a demo of the touchscreen mini panel for Fisim 2020. I hope you are doing well. Stay tuned if you are interested to see how to build one. Charlie, contact tower 120.5, so long. Baron 73 Charlie, San Francisco Tower, 1260 at 6, altimeter 9.9 or 7. You'd probably agree that that's not much fun with pushing a mouse around in your virtual cockpit. After all, when was the last time you saw a pilot using a mouse in the real cockpit? So that is the purpose for this project. Here is what we will be going over in this video. Let's start with the big picture. Here we have the mini panel on the left and FISIM 2020 on the right. And the two talk to each other through a piece of software called the FS2020 to Adreno running in Windows, which you can download from GitHub for free courtesy of Seahawk 240. It allows our panel to send commands to the SIM and to receive variables and status from the SIM. I believe it goes through SIM Connect. As you can see here, the variables we need are being updated many times a second. And next, the hardware diagram. At the center, we use a ESP32 microcontroller. It is compatible with the Adreno development tools, but this guy is far more superior than your traditional Adreno boards. Faster speed and most importantly more memories. And you can get one for under 10 US dollars. Also JTAG debugging is available for this uh, ESP32. Then we have the Nexion touchscreen display. I use a 4.3 inch model I know the screen is smaller than your cell phone, but it does the job at a compact footprint. A 7-inch model is uh, available if you really want a larger display. It connects to the controller via the UART port. You design the screen layout and the graphic with an editor from Nexion. It does require a bit of learning curve. Overall, I'm happy with its performance. Lastly, we have four rotary encoders. They are nothing special, but I would mention that the project currently is not using the push-button switches since we have the touchscreen. And the code is designed such that you can use either four or a single encoder. All you need is to change a constant and rebuild the code. Okay, before we talk about the firmware, let's have a closer look at the features of the main control pages. Today we are cruising in our citation longitude south of Toronto, Canada. First, the sidebar here. It has a shortcut to the most often used pages. 
The first three are intended to help the user to aviate, navigate, and communicate. We have seen this autopilot page before. The four rotary encoders are attached to this row of settings. Up here we have two OBS settings, the maximum banking and the auto brick setting. To adjust these settings up here, we touch on one of the numbers and the color changes to indicate they are now attached to our four encoders. To switch back to the bottom numbers, we touch one of the numbers and the encoders are now linked back to them. The navigation page is unfinished, mainly because the interface with FlySIM 2020 is lagging. The page currently gives you some information to the next GPS waypoint. The radios page is a bit unique. It doesn't implement the usual active and standby frequency pairs. What we have here is a pool of standby frequencies, six of them to be exact. You can swap any of them with the active COM or NAV radio as long as the frequency is compatible. With this, we can have a list of frequencies standing by, transversing from ground, tower, to departure, and center, etc. The devices page is straightforward. You have access to the common lights, ice protection, electrical and engine start switches. Now this situation page is an eyeful of over a dozen items in one place. I know many GA aircraft don't have some of these goodies in real life. They are nonetheless chosen to give the same pilot the one in all situation awareness during critical phases of the flight. We have here wind, gear position, terrain elevation, radar altimeter when below 2005 AGL. It comes in handy when landing. I open this page when I do the uh, landing challenges. You also have indicators for icing, parking brakes, and the reverser. And the position indicators for flaps, trim, and spoilers. Some items on this page are touchable. For example, switching between DME 1 and 2, the radio to or from a VOR, choosing between ground speed or airspeed, and the ultimate setting is adjustable here. Ah, before I forget, let me show you the uh, rubber band feature. Selecting an already current page hooks a rubber band to it. After browsing at another page for 10 seconds, it will automatically bounce back to the chosen page. Okay, we'll come back later for the more page. And now, for the next five minutes, we come to the boring topic of the firmware. For the firmware, I'll go over only the high level and a couple of data flow examples. The coding itself is way beyond the scope of this video. Starting with a block diagram, as I've mentioned, the controller firmware communicates with the FS2020 to Adreno software on Windows. On the other side, it has to manage the Nexion display. 
This project does not make use of the official Nexion library code. I have briefly looked at the libraries. It's kind of massive, so instead, I wrote a very compact class to do the job. You could actually write simple code to run on the Nexion processor itself, but the approach I took is to let the Nexion do as little as possible, and let the ESP32 be the master. That brings us to the Middle Earth here. We have three main tasks. The screen task mainly handles the touch events from the screen and send commands to the SIM. The SIM task reads data from the SIM and is responsible for updating information onto the display. And the encoder task simply waits patiently for you to turn an op and send a command onto the SIM. Speaking of the encoders, let's look at our first operation example. It shows what happens when you turn the knob to change the autopilot's heading. At number one, the encoder task sends the command to the FS to Adreno. Event code 428 is for the heading increment event. Meanwhile, FS to Adreno is continuously updating the SIM variables. A split second later, we should see a changed values for the heading arriving into the SIM task. The ID for the heading is 86, and the data for the heading is 123. So the SIM task carries on and updates the text field labeled txt.txt at the next scene with that value. All right, one more example. Let's say we touch the AP button on the autopilot page to engage the autopilot. That causes the Nexion to send a message to the ESP32. Here we have a six byte message, including an operation ID of 04, which we specified to represent the AP button. The screen task then gets the message and finds out that 04 is for toggling the AP button. It then sends an 88 event to FS to Adreno to tell the SIM to toggle autopilot. Again, the SIM task is receiving updates continuously. A split second later, it gets the variable 90 with a value of 1, which means the AP master is currently on. It went on to send the message to Nexion to choose one of two images to be displayed, an on button or an off button. This update actually occurs many times a second, whether the screen values have changed or not, because the incoming data is ever present. So you may be wondering, there are so many numbers dancing around, how do we keep track of what is what? And the other central piece of the design is the screen node. You can think of a screen node as the DNA for a given item on the touchscreen. It carries around the information and instruction needed whenever an object on the screen is called to action. Here is a simplified screen node for the autopilot heading. It contains the event number 428 to respond to an encoder event. It can tell that AP heading is involved when a variable 86 is received and knows where to update the screen, the txt.txt. One more example. With the autopilot button, the action begins when the user touches the button. The next one sends a predetermined message with the opcode of 04. Similar to the previous example, the chain of events will then involve sending out the same event 88 and then 90 identifies the variables for the AP button. And the PAP.pick is the next one label to update the AP button with image index of 8. I know there was a lot of information within a short period of time. I hope it helped to explain a little about what I believe to be the crucial part of the design. Before we wrap up, I have a couple more pages to show you. 
Well, did you have enough? Ah, there's one more thing. The more page. Yes, it is basically for accessing the pages that the sidebar doesn't have room to host. There are two configuration-related pages. First, SIM options. You set the time of day for the SIM with these two knobs. Oh, by the way, the orange indicators here tells you that there are two encoders attached to this function. Okay, now you can't say that I don't give you the time of day. And the SIM rate here lets you set the time acceleration option. Last but not least, configuring the panel itself. They are self-explanatory. Brightness adjustment, a sleep timer for the screen, and a choice of the barometer units. And that is all I have. As you have seen, this mini panel is by no means a home cockpit. For me, I can't justify the space, the money, and the time to build a fancy home cockpit. So this panel helps to reduce the amount of distraction from that annoying mouse. If you're interested, the link for the schematic and source code is below. Thanks for watching. Have fun.